Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I'd like to welcome you to this forum on improving the environment for entrepreneurship. And for those of you who are tweeting, we have set up a hashtag, hashtag TechCTI. That's hashtag TechCTI, so you can make comments and uh, post any reactions you have uh, during uh, the actual event. Entrepreneurship is crucial for job creation and building long-term prosperity. Research by the Kauffman Foundation has found that firms less than five years old are responsible for nearly all of the net job creation in the United States over the past 30 years. Uh, that constitutes uh, more than 40 million jobs. But in the past decade, the environment for high growth businesses has become unfavorable. The number of new firms with employees has dropped and there have been a number of other challenges uh, facing uh, the startup community. In response, the Startup America Partnership, which is the President's Job Council's working uh, uh, group, has proposed legislation called the Startup Act. This bipartisan bill seeks to reduce regulatory burdens, attract business investment, accelerate the commercialization of university research, attract and retain entrepreneurial talent, and encourage pro-growth state and local policies. Today, we are pleased to have three distinguished speakers who will explain what we need to do to create jobs and encourage entrepreneurship in the United States. Our first speaker is Steve Case, who's chairman and CEO of Revolution, LLC. Uh, Steve is chairman of the Startup America Partnership and also a co-founder of America Online. He also serves as chairman of the Case Foundation, the philanthropic organization founded with his wife, Jean. And with Ted, Ted Leonsis, he recently launched a new $450 million venture capital fund targeting later stage technology companies. The Honorable Jerry Moran represents Kansas in the U.S. Senate. He was elected to the Senate in 2010. Prior to that, he served for seven terms in the United States House of Representatives and for eight years in the Kansas State Senate. He is a member of the Senate's Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, the Small Business Committee, and the Veterans Affairs Committee. He has carved out as a reputation of someone who's worked very hard to strengthen our economy, create jobs, and foster the growth of small businesses in the United States. The Honorable Mark Warner is a senator from Virginia. He was elected to the Senate in 2008. Uh, previously, he served as governor of Virginia from 2002 to 2006. And speaking of the devil, great timing, Senator. <laughs> Just in time for your introduction. <laughs> I've heard of cutting it close, but... Uh, he serves on the Senate's uh, Banking, Budget, uh, Commerce, and Intelligence uh, Committees, and he has uh, uh, established a reputation for uh, bipartisan and common sense solutions to reduce the federal deficit. So we will hear uh, first from uh, Steve Case, so please join me in welcoming Steve to the Brookings Institution. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Daryl, for that introduction and also the leadership you provided in Brookings on this issue when we were scouring the, the, the region uh, last year for best, the best ideas around entrepreneurship. Daryl was one of the ones who helped brainstorm with us, so we appreciate that. And obviously, it's a great honor to be here with uh, Senators Warner and Moran, who really have taken the lead with the introduction of the Startup Act that uh, they'll talk to you about. Uh, let me first uh, set the stage, which is, uh, I think Tom, sometimes we forget this here in Washington. Uh, but America is really built on the backs of entrepreneurs taking risk. We're not the leading economy in the world just by accident. We just wake up one day and suddenly we're the leading economy. Fortune 500 companies don't just you know, wake up one day and suddenly they're Fortune 500 companies. They start as startups with, backed by entrepreneurs who have a big idea and want to change the world and want to build that idea, thankfully, uh, in many cases, here in the United States. So as a nation, we need to recognize that entrepreneurship really is the secret sauce that has helped build us to get us to this point, and we need to redouble our commitment to that. And there's two particular things I would focus your attention on. One is, just as we've seen the globalization of manufacturing, uh, particularly over the last 10 or 20 years, which has gotten a lot of attention, we're now seeing, in the more recent, in the last decade or so, the globalization of entrepreneurship. You know, countries around the world are, have woken up to the fact that this is one of the, you know, one of the real defining characteristics of, of the United States and its robust economy and are trying to build their own entrepreneurial ecosystems and their countries have the right 
uh, government uh, policy framework in place to support those uh, those entrepreneurial companies. So they're stepping up their their efforts. Meanwhile, our entrepreneurial uh, engine, our entrepreneurial economy, is sputtering a bit. If you look at the statistics uh, since uh, 2007, the number of new starts are down 23 percent. If it had stayed at the same level and the level of job creation in each of these startups had stayed at the same level, we'd have two million more jobs in the economy right now. So this is, this is sort of a, a big deal. So right now, it is important as a nation that we focus on what got us here, which is this entrepreneurial, innovative you know, culture that has driven our uh, economy, ensured our competitiveness, obviously is a, a huge job creator, as, as Daryl mentioned, the Kauffman Foundation that tracks this uh, uh, really well. Uh, their data says 40 million jobs have been created in the last three decades by high-growth entrepreneurial companies. And account, in their view, accounts for all the net job creation in our nation in the past three decades. So if you're concerned about unemployment being too high at you know, eight plus percent, focusing on entrepreneurship is a way to get it down. If you're concerned our economy is too slow, growing at you know, two, two and a half percent, entrepreneurship is the way to kind of kind of get that moving. If you're concerned about our competitiveness in what is now a more competitive global world, uh, focusing on entrepreneurship so we really continue not just to build companies here but entire new industries here really is critical. So that sort of sets the stage. So I'm going to give you a little update on what's happened uh, in the last uh, you know, year or so. A year ago this week, we actually, our first anniversary was yesterday, uh, we launched the Startup America Partnership. And there's two parts to this, and sometimes it gets a little confusing. One is a private sector effort that I chair called the Startup America Partnership that is mobilizing resources from large companies to help small companies, so the next generation of entrepreneurial companies get started and, and scale. And over 50 companies in this first year have made commitments over a billion dollars of resources, discounted services, free services to help these companies get started. And we also are launching regional efforts, what we call startup regions. Uh, and right yesterday we launched in, I think it was uh, 10 new, new uh, places. Now we're up to 18 of these uh, regions. I was honored to be uh, launching Startup uh, Virginia. Uh, and so we're, we've, so, I think, shown great progress over the past year in mobilizing the private sector to do its part to try to help this next generation of entrepreneurial companies, and that work will, will obviously uh, continue. That's the partnership. Separate from that, about the same time a year ago, the White House and, uh, introduced their own Startup America effort and started building momentum from both in terms of what the White House can do and also trying to you know, figure out what the right policy framework for the nation as, as a whole might be. And they asked the President's Jobs Council, which was formed about a year ago, chaired by Jeff Immelt, CEO of General Electric, to focus on this issue. And I, in turn, was asked to chair the area around high-growth entrepreneurial companies. We met with the President, the whole Jobs Council met with the President uh, in October and laid out our, our recommendations, which are uh, all available uh, online. Since then, we've seen enormous uh, momentum uh, in Congress, about a dozen different bills in the House and Senate, some from Republicans, some from Democrats, some which we prefer in a, that are come in a bipartisan way, uh, that have really built on uh, some of these ideas. Uh, and, and the key ones for us are winning the global battle on talent, looking at the issue of high-skilled uh, workers, immigra you know, these immigrant entrepreneurs and engineers are, are job makers, not uh, job takers. We do a great job as a nation attracting people here to our great schools, give them PhDs, but all too often then kick them out of the country, forcing them to go to other countries to start companies that compete with our, our, our uh, uh, companies here in the United States, which is crazy. It would be the equivalent of, of if we let people from, from China come to the Naval Academy, train them, and then kick them out and said, now you have to go to China and work for the, you know, the Chinese Navy. You know, nobody would think that would make sense, but that's effectively what we're doing now, right now. So taking a fresh look at our immigration policies, particularly around high-skilled workers, is critical. What we've recommended is dealing with that in a, in a discreet way. Obviously, there are much more complicated issues around comprehensive immigration reform and the DREAM Act and other kinds of things, but we think it's important to focus specifically on this issue around high-skilled workers. That's number one. Number two is relaxing we're just modifying uh, some of the regulations that, uh, that around capital formation. Two in particular that we think are important are the issue of crowdfunding. The platforms have emerged in the past decade that make it easy for people to fund projects. If you're you know, doing a documentary, for example, you can use platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo to essentially get you know, dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people to contribute to your your, your project, though you cannot yet use those to fund the start of a company. We think that should be made possible, uh, and that's called crowdfunding. 
Uh, and the other piece is relaxing or creating an on-ramp for IPOs, initial public offerings. When, when AOL went public almost 20 years ago, most of the offerings were relatively small. 80% at the time of the offerings in the 1980s were under $50 million. Now only 20% are under $50 million. The reason for that is it's gotten more costly and expensive to uh, to go public, so fewer companies are doing it or they're doing it later, or more often, instead of going public, they're being sold, and that's a problem in terms of our job creation engine, because often when companies are sold, job growth decelerates. If they go pump, uh, public, job growth accelerates. One statistic there is that for venture-backed companies, over 90% of the job creation happens after companies go public. So having an on-ramp for IPOs, we think, is uh, is uh, uh, very uh, important. So those are some of the key things. I, I, I'm sure we'll hear some more details from uh, the senators on them, but I uh, you know, just wanted to set that, that framework in terms of some of the key things that we're, uh, we're focusing on. In October, uh, two senators, Senator uh, Rubio from Florida and Senator Coons from uh, Delaware, introduced something called the AGREE Act. Basically said, let's look at all the proposals that have been made by Republicans and Democrats in the House and the and the Senate in the last you know, couple of years, and let's take the ones that everybody kind of agrees make sense, sort of the low-hanging fruit, if you will. Let's put those in something. Let's call it the AGREE Act, and we can at least get that passed. If, you know, we, may, we, may have, we obviously do have disagreements on a lot of things. It's an election year, and that's, you know, that's what elections are for. But can't we at least focus on the things we all agree should happen and, and try to get those, uh, those things done? So that AGREE Act was interested in, in, introduced in uh, October. Uh, and then a startup act that you'll hear more about uh, really built on that, but took it to another level, and I think is the best you know, legislative approach that's currently uh, out there with bipartisan support if we could rally to get the Startup Act passed, either as it's currently proposed or maybe with a, a few little tweaks. And I think that would be the, you know, the best way to, to move things forward. And then last week in the State of the Union, and then yesterday uh, the pre at a, his cabinet meeting, uh, the president came out, I think rather forcefully, uh, that as a nation we now need to focus on, on entrepreneurship. He, he made some of the points I made earlier about the importance of, of that. And yesterday at his cabinet meeting, Karen Mills, the, the uh, head of the Small Business Administration, is now formally a member of the cabinet, and that was the first time she was attending as a formal official cabinet member. Uh, he introduced what they called the Startup America legislative uh, proposal, which really is very similar to the kind of things that you see in the Startup Act and, and also some of the things in, in the Agree Act. So from my perspective, uh, we, we're seeing more attention now in Washington on the importance of this issue. We're seeing bipartisan support, and I, you know, obviously getting bipartisan support these days is hard. Getting an election year is harder still, but this is an area that, that we do have uh, you know, bipartisan support uh, uh, building. And the specific proposals that around the, the key issues, there really is a, a fair amount of uh, agreement on. So I think the real challenge is how do we get this done quickly? The President said yesterday if, he, if Congress gets a bill to his desk, he will sign it immediately. I think it's imperative that we really use the next couple of months to capitalize on this moment kind of galvanize the entrepreneurial community, galvanize the, the tech community. Ernst & Young has a program called the Entrepreneur Year Award, for example, and in a few weeks they're having a number of people who've won this award before kind of help, kind of march on Washington, talk to uh, folks in the, in the Congress to you know, kind of put some, some pressure on this process. Yesterday I posted something on TechCrunch, a, a widely read a technology blog urging people in the tech community to, to kind of stand up and have their, their voices heard. We've got a moment here where on an issue that's critical to our nation and our future in terms of job creation, economic growth, and competitiveness, uh, and that, that we already have specific proposals, kind of everybody kind of has a pretty clear sense of, of what needs to happen. Now it's time that we really come together and actually make it happen. And the leadership that Senator uh, Warner and Senator Moran have provided here is really you know, critical. They spent a lot of time with their staffs in the, in the fall time frame, really trying to understand what really was 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 the right approach here. Uh, came together with a with a startup act, uh, building on some work the Kauffman Foundation had done, which was which was uh, terrific. Building on some of the work the Jobs Council, other groups had 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 done. Uh, but it's, I think the time has ended for new proposals. Uh, the time is now for action around those proposals and, and building the right coalition and build, building bipartisan support. If we do that, if we, if we get, seize this moment and we are able to get something passed by the Congress and signed by the President uh, over the next couple of months, I think it really will put us on the right footing so our nation really will be able to preserve its, its position right now as the world's most entrepreneurial country. Uh, it, it, we, there's a lot still going for us. I mentioned before some of the 
things that are disconcerting in terms of new startups and the globalization of entrepreneurship and so forth. Uh, but, but, but if we act now, we can preserve our lead in, in the world. If we're slow or we continue to debate this, uh, I think we're going to be uh, unhappy with the, uh, the results. So we have a moment. Uh, let's capitalize on it. And thank you, for Brookings, for hosting this. And, and thank you, the senators, for taking the lead on this. And I think we'll now move into a panel discussion so you hear more specifics. Thank you. for his uh, opening uh, comments. And uh, in terms of our uh, discussion, I'll uh, pose a couple questions, then we'll open the floor to uh, questions uh, from the audience. So I'll start with uh, Senator uh, Moran. I mean, you have introduced uh, the Startup uh, Act. Uh, what do you think are the most important things we can do to encourage entrepreneurship? Well, uh, I appreciate, again, Brooks and Brookings uh, hosting us today, and great to be with Steve and Mark, and appreciate you, Daryl, uh, for uh, moderating this, uh, this opportunity. What we're doing here today I hope highlights the things that we think are important, and I would outline those as a regulatory and tax environment in which entrepreneurship, startup capital creation, capital creation, and uh, job growth is is honored, is is uh, is enabled. Uh, we need to make certain that we do the things uh, as public policy in public policy that encourages people who have ideas uh, to bring them to the forefront in the process of pursuing wealth, uh, their own success. Uh, the great news about uh, entrepreneurship is it brings other people along. It's job creation. So at, at the top of our list, I, I, don't know, I don't know whether Mark and I would, uh, would rank these in different ways, but the Startup Act, based upon Kauffman Foundation research, recommendations from the, the, the President's Council, uh, we would say that a regulatory environment that is not a hindrance uh, to uh, beginning a business and taking it to market, uh, acquiring the capital and hiring employees, a tax code that encourages an ability to attract and retain a workforce, uh, to encourage entrepreneurship by people who come to the United States from other countries and want to remain here and help us create jobs, uh, and also competition among the states. Uh, our legislation requires certain reporting by states uh, across the, the country, not for purposes of more paperwork and reports, but so that a person who is interested in beginning a business can look at those reports and determine Here's a state that accentuates the things that I desperately need in my plan to succeed. And so we can compare Kansas to Virginia or Oregon to Florida as a place in which we can bring uh, our entrepreneurial skills. So uh, it, it is the things that uh, Steve Case just outlined that uh, when, when you say what's the most important. Uh, my interest in this topic, and, and I'll, uh, Mark and I were together uh, on a, on a television program last night, and we got filibustered by a couple of House members, and I'll try not to replicate <laughs> Charlie Rangel uh, on Kudlow last night. But it, not, it, not to mention specific <laughs> names. Oh, yes, not to mention specific names. But uh, the, 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 this issue, to me, came about uh, as a result of, as an individual member of Congress, as an American citizen who believes that the deficit has huge consequences to us in this country, our, our, and it and has a, a, a huge consequence to our ability to create capital and to expand the economy and to grow. Uh, and the point that I would make is that when the deficits are as large as they are, it makes it difficult for many businessmen and women to reach the conclusion that the future is bright. Uh, we're ha you have to have concern that we're not the next country to have significant financial problems. And so I've been very disappointed in our ability as a Congress and an administration to come together and resolve the deficit issue. I'm not walking away from that. A concern of mine, and I will continue to work, I'm, it wasn't mentioned, but I'm a member of the Appropriations Committee, will continue to work on the spending side of uh, the, the financial issues that our country faces. But it occurred to me that the other way we can address this significant issue is to make sure that we are a growing economy. Growth policies are in place, meaning more people are working, uh, and additional taxes are being paid, and we're reducing the deficit as a result of growth. So I think the, the reason this is so important uh, is that it allows for people to pursue success. 
in the process of pursuing success, it brings uh, more people to uh, the employment uh, in our country and allows them to pay taxes, reducing this tremendous uh, difference between the revenues we bring in and the expenditures we make. Uh, and in, there, in and of itself, increases the chances that more people, more businesses are going to decide our country is on the right path, we can invest and grow. So it's the, it's the five things I think that we outline in our legislation would be the things that we think are important in creating that environment. Okay. Uh, Senator Warner, you've been very active at looking at ways to free up capital for new businesses. So what are the policy changes that you think would be most important? Well, let me, first of all, again, say thanks to all of you, but um, echo what both Steve and Jerry have said uh, on, on a couple areas. One, um, you know, this is something that attracted to me because before I was in this business, I was an entrepreneur. Uh, I was a, you know, after failing miserably twice, I had this uh, third chance to fall into the cell phone industry, and a little company called Nextel came out of that, uh, then was a VC. So this notion of, of the research that Kaufman came out with and that Steve has lived, you know, I've had the opportunity to live a, bit, a little bit as well. And I think sometimes we think about a lot of the startup companies, high-growth companies being almost exclusively technology, and they're not. I mean, you know, look at just recently, Lula Lemon. Uh, Under Armour, Chipotle, you know, they, these are across a whole series of, of areas. I'd also echo what Steve and Jerry have mentioned that, you know, this is kind of the moment. One of the things that makes me crazy in Congress, and there's a long list, um, <laughs> is this kind of sense that you know, conventional wisdom right now, whether it's debt, this issue, or anything else, oh, we're going to punt it all until after the election. I mean, think about this. You know, you got a business that's hemorrhaging red ink, revenues can't meet its expenses, and you'd say to your, you know, your shareholders, well, you know, we got a problem, but we're going to get back to you in the spring of 2013? That's crazy. So let's go ahead and see if we can find uh, things to get done. I still believe debt for another day, but this is one, echoing what Jerry said, where we can get something done that can have an enormous positive emphasis on growth. And one of the things... Again, I think that Steve made mention, we as politicians always like to celebrate small business. You know, the secret that the Kauffman Foundation pointed out, and I think we all kind of knew in our guts, is that you know, it really is a subset. It is these startup firms, the gazelle firms, whatever we want to call them, where the vast preponderance of job growth has come. You know, traditional small business, the barbershop, the hardware store, they're not the same growth engines that the kind of firms we're talking about here. And I think what we have done, and, and there are other pieces of legislation, and I just simply reiterate what's already been said, let's take you know, competition for talent. Uh, we got a piece of legislation that finally does what we've all talked about for 10 years, staple a green card to those folks who get those graduate degrees in the STEM fields, as well as both lower and create a new category for entrepreneur visas. Let folks who are job creators actually start here. Um, as well as there's other legislation about lowering caps and H-1P other issues. Uh, we, echoing what, what Jerry said, let's look at the regulatory standpoint, both in terms of overall regulatory, looking at cost-benefit analysis, but then the specific regulations, kind of the on-ramp proposals in terms of, of, um, uh, of startup ventures, particularly Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, we said, look at what can we do on, on tax treatment. Now, again, there's a little bit of contradiction for me who wearing my deficit hat, wants to do massive tax reform in terms of simplifying, but uh, we acknowledge that. But, you know, it says, what can we do in terms of tax treatment? We've got a variety of proposals in terms of making permanent exemption from, from uh, uh, capital gains, uh, particularly giving those first couple years accelerated or even full write-off from your corporate taxes that first year you go profitable. You know, and again, there's variations the administration has, but how do you make sure you can put favorable tax treatment in place? Um, <clears throat> so... Talent, regulatory, tax, as Jerry mentioned as well, how do we create a healthy competition between states? So the um, states that are already regarded as the best ranked for business in the whole country, the Commonwealth of Virginia, states like Kansas can be competitive to them. <laughs> do I have a you, No, you don't get a rebuttal yet. And then, and there then, goes the discussion there goes right the there. There goes the discussion. But also, Let's keep this one, other, one other thing that we did that, that didn't get a lot of attention that's not in a lot of the other proposals um, that we, we put in place, uh, and this will 
you know, if it gets a little more legs, will cause some, probably some consternation, is that it says, you know, I think the federal government, in terms of sponsored research, those dollars under assault, I think they are extraordinarily valuable in creating the ecosystem of innovation in our country. Uh, but that area hasn't been shaken up for a while. We take a small sliver of those research dollars and say, you know, let's create a competition on how we can get that, those ideas from laboratory into commercialization. But looking at that, uh, that revenue stream. Uh, and I think that what we can do right now is taking our legislation, taking the AGREE Act, and there are four or five other pieces of legislation just on the Senate side, almost all bipartisan, Let's see if we can uh, take the best ideas of all these and uh, get this moment, as Steve has talked about, and you know, see if we can do that. You know, let's try to meet the president's challenge and get him a bill this spring. Okay, uh, Steve, uh, the senator was just alluding to the role of universities in this, and uh, we certainly know that universities are a crucial uh, player in terms of uh, innovation, uh, startups, and entrepreneurship. Uh, but a lot of people have the sense that there are barriers that make it difficult to get the university ideas into the marketplace. So I'm just wondering, what is your take on what we can do to help universities do a better job of commercializing their knowledge and research? Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, there's another initiative uh, that uh, a co-chair called the National Advisory Council on Innovation Entrepreneurship that was part of the Commerce Department. And one of the areas they focused on was, was this issue. And a couple of came, points came out of it. One is that continuing to invest in this research is, is critical. That, that, uh, obviously, we do have a significant fiscal problem, but one of the areas we need to still invest in is some of the basic research. Bigger companies that used to do it, like AT&T, when they have Bell Labs, really haven't done it. Other countries are doing it. And it has been the way we've been able to pioneer not just technologies, but entire new, new industries. The Internet, for example, which obviously I'm, I'm a beneficiary of, really came out of basic research funded by the defense uh, DARPA 50-plus uh, years ago. And initially, it was done with a security kind of orientation, but then that commercialized and created the internet, which then created enormous economic growth and, 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 and job creation. So that there's a you know, long history. There are many other tech, GPS and other technologies that, that people could point to that would only have come out of that basic research uh, that was uh, happening either at the federal level directly through things like uh, DARPA or more likely federal funding into universities where innovation was, uh, was happening. At the same time, the second piece was the, the general sense, and a few do this better, but the general sense was that the that, that research that was happening in those universities was all too often locked within the walls of that university. And the interconnections with the entrepreneurial communities in those regions, let alone nationally, generally aren't very good. In some cases, uh, in some cases they are. Indeed, part of the success of Silicon Valley is Stanford has a more porous approach, more flexible approach to how they how they intellectual property and, and things like that, but that that's somewhat uh, rare. So there are a number of different models that were being looked at, a number of different trials that were were, were recommended uh, to try to push that forward. In North Carolina, for example, there are a lot of folks in that uh, region where you, know, you can see Chapel Hill and and uh, you know, uh, NC State, I believe, and a couple others were working on coming together with sort of a regional uh, approach there. Uh, so I do think we need to figure out a, a, a better way to do it. So continue to fund it makes sense, but we should be able to get a bigger bang for the buck in terms of how those technologies are then uh, commercialized. But that's something that I'd put off on the side, frankly, because it, it, it's, a, it's, it's something that is happening where we could do a better job of commercializing that. I think the real uh, crisis that we should be focused on, which is why the Startup Act and acting you know, right now is, is so critical, are issues where we actually do need significant changes in government policy to be able to, to, to move the needle. And, and the, it, we, as we've all talked about, this issue of talent and immigration policy is critical. The issue of crowdfunding, you know, Sarbanes-Oxford, the IPOs are, are critical. We can have a lot of experiments with the university commercialization in a lot of different places over the next five or 10 years, and some will work and some won't work, and we'll learn from the best and you know, mod, you know, modify our things. That's a process that, that is underway and will need to continue. 
uh, we cannot move on these bigger issues uh, unless we have a, a change at the at the you know the national policy level, and that does require there are things the private sector, as I mentioned, through the Start America Partnership is doing. There are things the administration is doing. With the you know, SBA has done a number of things, and Sean Green, I saw in the audience, who's actually led the effort at the SBA around. Uh, the kind of high growth companies and and how the SBA can be more more flexible. Some things have happened. The patent office to try to you know, put a process in place to fast track uh, uh, things for for entrepreneurial uh, you know, companies. Yesterday, I saw the president called on Homeland Security to take a fresh look at some of the how do you with the existing immigration policies. How can they be a little more flexible? Uh, so some things are happening uh, at that level, but. The conclusion of the Jobs Council, certainly my conclusion, is even if the private sector continues to step up, even if the administration tries to do what it can administratively, uh, we're going to lose this, this uh, battle, uh, global battle around entrepreneurship unless the, the Congress comes together with the White House to put this, this policy framework in place. So that's why the Startup Act is, is so important. I think, the, as I understand it, from the President and uh, Gene Sperling and it was really driving with the White House. Uh, there was a desire to embrace some of the existing proposals, put a framework in place, which is why it was called the Startup America Legislative Package or Program or uh, something without proposing explicit legislation out of respect for the work that had been happening in the Senate and the House with Republicans and Democrats and not wanting to be overly prescriptive in terms of exactly what it would be. But they laid out some pretty precise uh, you know, proposals on, on in a pretty precise way. So I, hopefully that can now be the, the you know, galvanizing event. Uh, uh, and several people, it goes back to the cynicism Mark uh, mentioned, you know, as we're doing this work in the last few months, we're, we're saying, well, this is all nice. Of course we need to do it, but you know, nobody's going to do it because it's election year. And you know, by the way, you know, the president really hasn't led on this issue and really you know, kind of focused the you know, nation's attention on this issue and called for action and, and, and so forth. Well, now that's happened. You know, now we've got Things like the Startup Act and, and the Agree Act, uh, they're clearly the House is, is in, uh, Speaker Boehner yesterday put out a statement saying that the you know, President's proposals uh, made sense. Indeed, were highly consistent with proposals that had already passed in, in the House. So he's happy to see that. So there, there's now this, this momentum around uh, the issue. But you know, it's time to score. We're kind of using a, since it's Super Bowl week, using a football analogy. We're kind of in the red zone here, but you know, you got you got to score to have points on the board. We have not yet scored. It's great that we're in the red zone. It's great that you know people are focusing on this issue, but I think it's now or never. The next couple of months, whether we can we can put some points on the board, and I'm certainly happy to do my part. And I'm grateful that folks who actually can do something about it uh, are, are doing their part. And we're looking for touchdowns here, not field goals, right? Exactly. So, okay. Uh, I have one uh, quick question for the two senators, then we'll open the floor uh, to uh, uh, questions. I mean, there have been several examples of bipartisan legislation uh, introduced, uh, including the Startup Act and the Agree Act. Uh, we have one Republican and one Democrat. I don't know if that makes you the DC version of the odd couple. I don't know who's Felix and who's Oscar here. But can you just uh, describe how, you, how the two of you found common ground and whether this represents hope for the future in terms of other policy actions. Um, happy to discuss that because perhaps this is a role model that uh, could be replicated. Uh, and, and this, I think, is an area in which Republicans and Democrats ought not have natural uh, differences. Uh, there's a great opportunity in, in the topic of, of, of pro-growth policies that uh, each party ought to, ought to embrace naturally. Um, as I said, I got interested in this from, from the perspective of trying to grow the economy because we were doing, uh, in my view, uh, an inadequate job, a woefully inadequate job in regard to the issue of the deficit. Uh, and Kauffman Foundation in, in my backyard in Kansas City was a, a great uh, provider of research and information. Uh, that's something I think that's very helpful. Uh, Kauffman has uh, a, a solid reputation and it makes it easy to talk to my colleagues about the basis of the Startup Act coming from the Kauffman Foundation academic research. That, that, that reduces the, uh, the political friction that could occur if, if you have a different originator of the ideas behind your legislation. So I think that that's helpful. Uh, and um, we just started working our way down the, the Kauffman Found, Foundation recommendation. And I, I think early on decided what's what Steve is, is reminding us is this ought not be about introducing a bill that gets a headline in Kansas that says Moran introduces bill. Uh, I think that's one of the problems with politicians or politics today is that we judge our success 
uh, on the on the media or the story that's told about actions that don't necessarily ever result in any real consequence. <laughs> so you, you, you pat yourself on the back because you made the evening news with a story that you introduced a bill, or that you're in the headline in your hometown paper saying you introduced legislation to solve a problem. The, the reality, it was clear to me that this issue is one that needs something more than just the, the political stamp of approval at home we have a senator who's doing something, he introduced a bill. And so then we started looking for the expertise and for uh, senators who, who were held in, uh, in high regard generally and specifically on entrepreneurial issues. Uh, and uh, that made it very easy for us to come to Mark and say, um, we have an idea, you have a following and an, and an appreciation for, for this topic, uh, and uh, you, you have a lots of leadership skills and abilities, we'd like to partner with you. And uh, you know, graciously, uh, uh, Mark made the decision uh, that, uh, that we, could, we could do this. We're not in total agreement on every aspect of what ought to be in the bill. And the end result is something that we, we both support, we both agree with. Uh, I think the regulatory piece it needs to be uh, firmer, uh, broader, more encompassing, uh, and but the realization there is that all the regulatory issues that I think business faces today uh, is not going to be probably resolved in a piece of legislation. Every member of Congress has a, a regulatory thought. We pick the ones that we think are the most important and the ones that consensus can be built around, the ones that are evidenced by uh, the, the Jobs Council and their work and uh, what the Kauffman Foundation said. And so it's just, I mean, the point I make there is that uh, two individuals who, who don't necessarily have to agree on everything certainly have the ability to agree on a lot. Uh, and that seems to be something that uh, Congress could pay uh, some attention to. Uh, and it, this idea that is perpetuating that we can't do anything because it's an election year uh, is so troubling to me. And I, I really do believe our country is in a circumstance in which we have little time to, 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 to meet our challenges, solve our problems. But if you actually believe that Congress can never accomplish anything because it's an election year, we have elections every two years in this country. There will always be the excuse that we can't do anything because the election is around the corner. In my lifetime in politics, we used to say, well, we're not going to get this done before the election. But we said that a couple weeks out from an election. Uh, now that it's become a year and a half away from an election, the, the, we have narrowed the window uh, in, in, in such a way that uh, it makes accomplishment not headlines, uh, impossible. And the goal here is accomplishment, not headlines. Let me just echo Jerry's one been a great partner. He's brought a real energy and enthusiasm to this in terms of you know, the work from the Kauffman Foundation, the interest he's got from Kansas. And, and I agree with what you said. We've probably got 80, 85 percent of the way there in terms of common agreement. But that's still a huge touchdown. Mm. <laughs> you know, and the thing that is um, just two quick other points. One is, uh, to Jerry's point about you can't take the election year off, it's not like the rest of the world is saying, you know, China, India, Brazil are saying, okay, time out in 2012 because America's got an election. You know, they're still racing ahead, so um, we can't wait. And to this point, Darryl, I would, the one point I would argue is that in this space, at least, there's very little Democrat versus Republican. Each of the bills... Most, each of the bills that are out there, uh, the four or five, and there's, a, there's the, the Coons Rubio bill, there's a Schumer-Toomey bill, there's a Tester, I think, Schumer-Toomey bill, there's a couple of those. They're all bipartisan. So can we get this, can we do our little bit of our own crowdsourcing here right. with uh, guys and gals who are interested in this space, build this coalition, push it through? Let, let me say one other thing that when I talk about a role model, it's actually been evident in my time. I've only been a senator for now 13 months. Uh, but as a result of, of Mark and I partnering on the Startup Act, Senator Wyden and I partnered on opposition to PIPA and SOPA uh, and introduced the Open Act as an alternative. Uh, and uh, I've gotten involved now in the issue of um, unlicensed uh, spectrum uh, with Senator Kerry. Uh, and so it, 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 there are these, I, I hope we can replicate this in a broader way on broader issues, a, a realization that the, the the country de demands, needs, requires uh, some level of ability to reach a consensus, even when you don't get everything you want. But there are these issues that, that are significantly important to our country that simply when they see 
Mark and I working together, it becomes clear that, and, and Mark is a perfect example of this because of his efforts on the Gang of Six, uh, deficit reduction, this is something that he's lived. And so uh, he, he uh, I'm trying to emula emulate uh, the, the, the circumstance in which he's found the ability to find Of course, partners. we haven't exactly scored on that one yet. <laughs> uh, he needs yeah, the a jury is strong about that He it. needs a victory, so we need to, to win on the Startup Act. And I would in, just indicate finally that the, 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 our efforts with, the, with Senator Wyden on PIPA and SOPA demonstrate yep. we got to replicate that on other issues, that the ability for people to communicate. And, and I, would, I would think that the entrepreneurial issues are ones that the same, that, that many of the people who cared about uh, PIPA and SOPA would care about as well, and you have the uh, th those people who have that interest have the ability to replicate their political will that was demonstrated in, in Congress just a couple weeks ago, and certainly that became a bipartisan, uh, perhaps retreat, uh, from, a, from a position that was believed by most of us to be firmly held by very powerful members of the, of the Congress and broadly supported by significant interest groups one of those issues you would think that uh, you, you couldn't resolve because it's already been, the, the conclusion has already been reached, and it was the efforts of Americans across the country who, who responded in a way that brought Republicans to, and Democrats together in, uh, we've got to find a different solution. Well, maybe these, gr what maybe these green shoots of bipartisanship will become a model for other people. That, you said it better than I did in much uh, fewer words. <laughs> but, but obviously, my, my particular focus is on, on, on this entrepreneurship issue, but I think what, what both senators are saying is really important. I think American people are sick and tired of this. They, they, don't, they don't understand why you know they, they can't get stuff done. You know, it's like important stuff for whatever reason can't get done. This issue, there's sort of three parts to it. One part is understanding the strategic urgency and criticality of doing the right thing to make sure we remain the world's most entrepreneurial nation. Good agreement on that. You know, you hear people say, oh, no, I don't think we should be the most entrepreneurial nation. I don't really much care what China or Singapore or other people do. People, people actually do recognize it's important, do recognize, the, as I said, the history of America, do recognize the job creation. So I think our, there's a growing, uh, I think, uh, uh, recognition of the, the nuances around, it's not just about the private sector or business as sort of a monolith. There is a role for large companies, Fortune 500 companies. They're important. They play a significant role in terms of, uh, jobs in the economy. There's a role, as, 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 as Mark said, in terms of small business, restaurants, and so forth on Main Street. They also account for a lot of jobs and play a significant role. They're both key foundations of our, of our nation. But the real leverage is around these high-growth entrepreneurial companies. That's where the job creation happens. That's where the innovation happens. That's where the economic growth happens. That's the place we have to win the battle <coughs> in terms of global competitiveness. So that's one. People got to understand that. And there's broad consensus there. The second is, I think acknowledge that's important. What do we do about it? So what do we do from a policy standpoint to make sure we have the right uh, framework uh, in place? There also is tremendous agreement there, bipartisan agreement. There is some debate around the edges. How far should we go on the immigration? Agree Act had one, the St uh, Startup Act had another. How far do we go on regulations on crowdfunding? You know, the, the general sense is it should be up to $10,000 investments, but maybe there's some cap like it can't be more than 10% of your income because of the fears that people will invest in something and, and it won't work out and there'll be some, some problems. But so they're debating around the edges of what the exact provisions are, but the general, general agreement that opening that up would, would result in more capital flowing to entrepreneurial companies that will drive job growth and obviously some will fail, but some will succeed and kind of creating a little bit more of a open uh, system there, I think makes sense. There's agreement that the, and there was agreement before when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed that there was something unique about young companies and IPOs. There was a carve out for IPOs from small companies. They just set the bar too low. It basically is a market cap of $75 million. So it wasn't a debate that there needed to be a carve out. It was just a debate of what the carve out should be. And the reality is now, you know, no companies go public, or very few go public, with market caps under $75 million. We propose a jobs council of billion dollars. I think the, the, uh, the president's proposal yesterday was $700 million. That, you know, that's the zone we need to be in, where, it, where you still have significant precautions for investors, significant disclosures, but you're able to create an on-ramp so more companies can, uh, can, can, can go uh, public. So there's, there's, there really is agreement, as Mark characterized, 80 85%, which, which is 
Good. And so there's agreement, uh, there's strategic reports, agreement actually on what are the right policy solutions, and pretty clear agreement in terms of the, the specificity around each of those key anchor issues. So then we come to the third point, which is, okay, even if it's strategically critical to the future of our nation, and even if we can agree on what the right policy platform should be, policy approach should be, can the politics be handled in a way, particularly in election year, where people will come together on an issue of national urgency where they kind of agree on what we should do, but they have to then make the calculation of how does this impact their election, their party, and so forth. And I understand that, and that's like there's a, you know, just there's a little bit of a, that is the real world out there. But that's the part that we cannot let get in the way given the other two issues. Mm -hmm. And if we do, if we don't cap, you know, capitalize on this moment and get something done in the next uh, you know, couple of months and, and, and really heed the president's call to Congress, get me something I can, I can, I can sign, you know, and, and it, it, it will have broken down over politics, not strategy or policy. And we just can't let that happen. And can I just add on one last thing? Sure. I know we've got to get to the audience. It's just that um, you know, with those first, I think you hit it right on, Steve. You know, the, we've got agreement it's a need. We've got an agreement on the, the substance. You know, how do we get it done? We really do need, I mean, as, as somebody who uh, was very supportive of what Jerry and Ron did on the Sopa Pippa stuff, we've got to have, this has got to be elevated so that we hear from tech councils across the country, that we hear from the entrepreneurial groups, that we kind of touch a chord on this issue. Um, you know, this is, if we can't do it on this one where we've got agree it's a need, agree on the policy. And you know, here the politics is gonna be interesting. I think the politics of this will not be why the component parts people are against, but almost the effort to try to say, Hey, this actually might pass. So, what else can we ladle on? You know, and our job may be fending off, broadening this effort, picking those these five bills that are out there, seeing what we've got common consensus on, and then trying to make sure that yes, these other issues are important, but um, they may have to be dealt with on another day. Get this at least with your Super Bowl analogy. Okay, uh, let's bring the uh, audience in. Uh, so uh, there's a question right there on the aisle. There's someone with a microphone. If you can give us your name and your organization, and we'd ask you to keep your questions brief just so we can get to as many people as possible. <clears throat> Judd Harriet, documentary filmmaker. My question concerns the regulatory framework. Now, we hear the Republicans constantly railing against the administration for onerous regulations that stifle entrepreneurship and investment, but they never say which ones. And we just came off with a Republican administration of eight years where it was definitely anti-regulatory. So my question to the panel is, which regulations do the, does the entrepreneur field regard as most onerous and what would be acceptable? You want to start? You want me to start? Right. Well, I, I would just say that, you know, I think the regulatory challenge, I, I think sometimes it's being characterized as just this administration and whatever, you know, there really is not anything in place that has any regulatory agency actually look back and ever have pressure on them or incentive on them to eliminate regulations that have outlived their time. I mean, you think about any business in the world that wouldn't go back and kind of occasionally look at its policies and procedures and change them, they didn't they'd be out of business. So I, you know, I've got regulatory uh, legislation that would kind of be varied on a variation on a PAYGO approach that would say you add one, you got to find one, take away. The Brits have actually done it in a way, and you find that you can clean out things, you know, over, overly burdensome reporting requirements where there's a way to file electronically rather than paper, how you can consolidate things. So I think there is a, a place here. I think particularly what has been mentioned about Sarbanes-Oxley uh, on 404, the amount of regulations that are required in the act of going public as, as Steve mentioned, it used to be back in the heyday, in the wild days, and let's face it, maybe in the wild days, as somebody had a lot of companies in the late 90s that looked like they were going to be billion dollar companies that ended up as goose eggs. Um, there was too much exuberance at that point, but now you've got this cap at 75 million. Nobody goes public at 75 million. So there needs to be, in the administration, Democrats and Republicans agree, there ought to be this on ramp where you don't have 
in effect, the filings, regulatory costs being hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, which then provides a barrier to companies going public, even though going public would access capital that would allow the company to grow larger. That would be one in particular. Sarbanes Oxley 404. Example, when AOL went public uh, 20 years ago, we raised, I think it was $10 million, 10 or $15 million was the size of, of, of the offering. Uh, we had 200 employees. We had been at it for seven years. Eight years later, we had 10,000 employees. We were able to use that capital and then you know, the currency for acquisitions and so forth to grow rapidly and create a significant company and create a significant you know, number of jobs. Those kind of companies these days would more often get sold to some other company because they had a certain scale, investors, venture capital, particularly been in for you know, seven, eight years, kind of getting tired. Uh, and if you didn't have a path to an IPO, most, most often your companies will get sold. And as I said earlier, the statistics show that if companies are sold for a variety of synergies, the entrepreneurs leave, a variety of things happen, the job growth usually slows. They go public, you know, job growth usually accelerates. So that is, is one of the key areas. Just one thing, nobody's talking about if Facebook goes public at $100 billion and they're raising $10 billion, you gotta have a full filing. <laughs> Senator Moran? I just would say that you know, Sarbanes-Oxley is our example of the regulations in, this, uh, in, in the Startup Act that, uh, that is specific. And beyond that, it's process. It's not exactly the concept that Mark outlined in his bill uh, in which you offset a new regulation by eliminating an old regulation, but to put a, a cost-benefit analysis in place on new regulations and on independent agencies so that we can make certain that the regulatory benefits, the, the benefits of the regulation uh, exceed the cost uh, particularly the small business to startup companies, entrepreneurs uh, in, in, in the aggregate. Uh, we just want to make sure that the, ben the benefits exceed the, the cost. Other questions? Uh, right over here. We're sending the uh, microphone over to you right now. Hi, uh, Melanie Plegman, and I'm the co-founder of a crowdfunding platform called Motavi from Durham, North Carolina. So you must really like this session. <laughs> I was very excited. Yeah, I came all the way from Philadelphia today. So um, Thank you. anyway, so basically in November, I moved to D.C. slash I've been staying with family on living on their floors kind of thing to come try to get involved in the dialogue because when we wanted to go and do this crowdfunding platform in the EU because of an exemption there. So when we found out this legislation, there was different bills. Um, we got really excited and we wanted to be part of the dialogue. And so we already have a lot of companies from everywhere, from the Research Triangle area to Minnesota to Maryland, security startups to the Bay Area, all different range. And so with all this legislation, we've done a lot of work to look at every different provision, every different issue that's been brought up. And one, I guess my question is, it's really difficult because there are so many proposals, like you were saying. It seems like there's, you know, the, the bill of the week. It's kind of like what, you know, it's really difficult for us to figure out where we should be weighing in and where we should direct the political will. And so you're saying there might be some cherry picking from here and there and that type of thing. But like, I feel like we've really gone back to the entrepreneurs and asked them, okay, what do you think about this cap? How would that affect you or how would this, rule that you would have to inv interact with investors affect you. And we have a lot of companies that we're talking to and then trying to bring those stories. So like, what is the most effective way for, you know, for us to bring those stories and those ideas to you know, legislators who are working on these issues? And how do we know who is sort of going to be the best people to bring that to? Well, Senator Warner and I are the best people to bring. Yeah, I was going to say that. Because <laughs> they're here. Sorry. Um, and that, that's a great story. I mean, what, what you're telling me is very, very meaningful to me, very compelling. Uh, in, in a sense, you've taken a pause in your life for purposes of long-term improvement in our country's economy, and, and yours, I hope, as well. Um, and I just, what Senator Warner and I, what Mark and I talked about just yesterday was the, the two of us, our staff, sitting down and looking at all the proposals out there, uh, determining, at least in our view, what we thought were the ones that were perhaps the best ideas, still fit within the 85% of doable, uh, and then, then go to the authors of those, legis th those pieces of legislation and say, can we join together in a single bill a single piece of legislation that incorporates the best of all the ideas. Uh, but I want to take that a step further, which is just the fact that Mark and I think it's a good idea, or let me, let me be more personal, that I think it's a good idea is insufficient. Um, based upon what you're doing, your own experiences, plus your conversations and dialogue with others, uh, we would welcome your input in looking at those pieces of legislation about these are the things that would really make a difference in us getting accomplished in our business life what we want to accomplish. 
and how, how you communicate that to us is, uh, I, I will, I'm sure Mark and I will offer our staff uh, us to, to sit down. And, yeah, let me just, just make two quick in, uh, additions to that. One is, of all these ideas that are kind of make up this bucket, the crowdsourcing idea is probably because technologies move so quickly, is one of the newest and the least vetted. So, you know, my ask, particularly as somebody who's dealt with uh, tech folks for a long time, you know, the perfect can be the enemy of the good on this. You're going to have all these different proposals, all these different company sources that have slight variations on this. If you all can help come together on some common standard here and recognize there are going to be constraints, there are, there are appropriate, as the, the filmmaker said, you know, consumer constraint, consumer protections that are have to, which should, must be built into this, uh, you know, and, and not say, oh my gosh, you know, uh, they put the limit at $10,000 and 10% and we wanted it at $50,000 and no restraints on, you know, you may not get 100% of the loaf on this, particularly since it is such a new idea in a new category. If we can start down this path and see this tool does not get abused, uh, I think it can be expanded. But let's get it at least into the mix. And I, I, would, I would encourage you to look at the, uh, the, the, the legislative proposal the president rolled out yesterday, because that was based on a fair amount of dialogue with different folks. The, and, and the SEC has been looking at this for some time, and the, the Jobs Council, the National Advisory Council on Innovation Entrepreneurship, SBA. There's been a fair amount of, of work. And I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's actually pretty good and moves in the right direction. But I think that, that goes back to the urgency point, I think your story is, I hear this a number of places where there's actually one company that I was contacted probably about a month ago that started a couple of years ago doing similar kind of crowdfunding. Uh, credible entrepreneurs, initial backers, but basically they're running out of money and they weren't able to raise any more money because people said, look, the government just seems to be whatever, you know, not, not, not clarifying this. Why would we invest in something when we're not even sure it's going to be legal like next year or five years from now or maybe ever or something? And so they're going out of business. And they were saying, well, you, would you invest? I don't want to invest because I want to basically be arguing on behalf of all, all the people doing this and so forth. But that you know, that's, that's, it may go under while we're having this little you know, kind of debate inside the, the beltway. And thousands of companies that could have stayed in business and maybe had that chance to build a product or service if they had access to the $500,000 they need through a, a crowdfunding you know, platform, you know, also we're, we're going to lose those. So there's, there's a broader debate around the urgency of winning this global battle of entrepreneurship, but there's a much more near-term debate about these crowdfunding companies and people like you that are trying to build these things are going to go out of business if we don't get this clarified quickly. Uh, and a lot of other companies that could have benefited from that crowdfunding are going to go out of business. And obviously, we need to have the, the right protection. But the point I make is you can go to Las Vegas and lose $5,000. You don't have to be an accredited gambler to lose $5,000. Why are we saying you can't, you can't invest $5,000 in what might be the next uh, next L? And, and particularly when the internet allows transparency in terms of uh, information and, and protections. And you know, we'll have to tweak it over time, depending on what we learn. But clearly, it, 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 it makes sense. Uh, so let's, let's just do it and stop talking about it. Okay, we're going to make that the uh, benediction on this, but I want to thank Senator Warner, Senator Moran, and Steve uh, Case for uh, sharing their views, and we do hope that this example of bipartisanship will become a model. A moment of, of lack of bipartisanship, let me tout Kansas, since um, <laughs> <laughs> Virginia was mentioned. Uh, Clyde Cessna, for 12 times, tried to figure out how to fly a plane. Crashed 12 times in a row, 13th time succeeded, and built a company called Cessna, Kansas. A couple of brothers at uh, Wichita State University decided that they could deliver home pizza, uh, became Pizza Hut. Um, Kaufman Foundation that we've talked about originates with a man named Ewing Kaufman that ultimately his drug company that he started in his garage became Mary and Merrill Dow. Uh, there are opportunities, and I would add that Google has now chosen Kansas City as the location for their high speed. Uh, so we would welcome the entrepreneurial spirit represented in this room uh, for those who find uh, uh, Kansas and, appealing. And, 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 you know, I, and I won't mention in a rebuttal at all, except for I'm proud to claim Steve Cases of Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Startup America is proud you. to have Startup Virginia and Startup Kansas. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you all. <laughs>